Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideau, joined by the great philanthropist and founder of the Dr. Atlas Foundation, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how are you doing today? Good. Good. Thank you. Um, the big event is coming up, Teddy. Yeah, it is. What it do we got? Two, so two, weeks from, two weeks from Thursday? No, one week, right? I think it's one oh, week. Oh, one week. It's the 16th. Yeah. Well, oh, we're that's on, right. We're under the... If this was a fight, I'd be cutting everything down, you know? I'd be uh, yeah. cutting down the hitting. Uh, we'd finish our hitting up this week as far as anything close to significant. The old timers would say everything is over but the shooting. <laughs> yep. it's, it's all done but the shooting. So I booked my flight. I get in Thursday, Thursday morning, straight to Staten Island. Or Shaolin Allen, as the uh, Wu Tang Clan would say. Wu Tang Clan would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, there's a few other names. I'll leave them. I'll leave them out. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of you this weekend. I was watching. Uh, what was the final uh, Godfather movie? Michael Corleone, the death of Michael Corleone, something to that effect. The the one where he's like the final chapter. That was the one bad one in a beautiful, a great, great, you know. The trilogy was in uh, the 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 sequel was one of those rare sequels that matched up to the original. When it's an epic, yeah. iconic film, a classic film as The Godfather was, and the third one just they, it fell short. It fell short. It fell short, but I still enjoyed it. I loved the um, the acting was fantastic. I thought, except for except. I, I don't know. Maybe it was passable. I, I I don't even know. But except for the producer's daughter that was thrown in there, because the actress that was supposed to play the part of Michael's daughter grown up, uh, something happened at the last minute. That's very fair. <laughs> You're right. I hadn't. I forgot about her. I was so caught caught up with Al Pacino that I forgot. Yeah, she wasn't very good. <laughs> that, that was that was a famous producer um uh what was his name he's got vineyards coppola in. coppola yeah coppola. francis ford coppola his daughter filled in at the last second and played the part with andy garcia as a little bit of a you know love interest but andy didn't want to get you know shot in the head so he stayed away from it but um that was that was that was the weak leak. Francis Ford Coppola was the director, I believe. Oh, direct, he may have I'm directed sorry. and produced, but he was yeah. definitely the um, yeah. He was the director. director. Yeah, definitely the director. Um, Genius. Oh yeah, and and made so much money off those. He he wound up uh, opening Vineyard, uh, and he's got his own label of wine, you know, in uh, in yep. the vineyards in Napa Valley. Which is up to par with any vineyard, vineyards in the world. The, years ago, nobody would have. It would have been blasphemy to say such. A, oh, better than France, better than Italy. Yeah, Napa Valley stands up with any any vineyard. Uh, their, oh, for their sure. Qual, their quality of wines is, you know, like I said, it's up at the. It's it's with anybody. That's right. Speaking about things getting better, like wine. Um, the show has passed the 300,000 subscriber mark, which I feel proud of. I feel good about. I'm sure you do too. And um, that's, you know, that's a nice thing. It's It happened while I was over in Saudi Arabia getting millions of of hits with the work that we were doing over there with my son and my daughter. And... um. It, it just it's just nice to see people you know not only enjoying the show and but passing the word around where more and more sub people are subscribing you know i would say thank you thank you and please keep subscribing you know uh it's we we get all kind like last week's show we got probably close to 300,000 views total maybe even more but the subscribers it doesn't automatically mean that it that it automatically transcribes to subscribers 
You know, uh, people sometimes are just jumping in. They hear about the show. They're jumping in. They're watching it. We're asking you to subscribe. You want us to keep doing this? Please, please keep subscribing. Before we got on the air, I went out earlier, stopped in a store, in a local store here on Staten Island, and a guy came up to me, and he was getting his lunch. He said, Teddy, love the podcast. Love the podcast. (laughs) I said, oh, yeah. Well, good. Um, You're subscribed, right? Yes. (laughs) He he, he must have listened. He wants to listen These to it. These people be- really. better be careful. They know you'll take their phone and, and uh, give well, I, them an on-site inspection. I, I, I help them help themselves, put it that way. You know, I say, listen, I am a caveman. It's on all the iTunes channels. I don't know how to explain all of it, but you got a phone? Okay. Uh, you got YouTube? Okay, good. Uh, go to the fight with Teddy Atlas. Okay. All right, there it is. Good. Hit that subscribe <laughs> button. Good. All right. You're in. <laughs> oh, boy. But anyway, people are good, you know, for the most part. Some aren't, but we concentrate on the good people. And um, and then the ones that are, like, in between, we we try to pull them over and help them. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to help people. We're here to help people, uh, you know. And in and, and no all seriousness, uh, it doesn't mean we're right all the time. We're wrong a lot of times, but you're gonna get the you're gonna get the truth. You know the I mean just unvarnished truth. And you know some people like it, some don't. But it's the truth. You know I don't listen to the. Everyone knows that I don't go on the internet, right? Everyone knows that, so I don't hear the, the chatter out there unless somebody brings it to me. And and it's okay. It's all healthy. For me, it's okay. Both sides. You know, like Ali used to say, half the people that come, they come to see me win. Half the people that come, they come to see me lose. But they all come. That's all that matters. They all buy a ticket. And, you know, you guys don't have to pay nothing. Just get a, you know, just get a ticket. Just get a seat. And I I want you to know that I... I Appreciate all yous. I heard a little bit of the chatter that somebody, they they really enjoyed the breakdown last week. There were people that still feel that Ngannou won. And I told you, I, my theory, the phenomena of that, when people are witnessing something that they didn't think they would witness, you know, something that's unprecedented or something that's, that's just a big upset, something that was unfathomable. It was unfathomable that Ngannou in one pro fight could beat the heavyweight champ of the world. So they're watching and he drops him. And he's, you know, he's he, he looks good. He looks good. And right away, you kind of race past the pages in between and you write your own ending. It's human nature. You write your <laughs> own ending. He won. He won. He won. And, you know, I took the time to come home off that long trip, take a shower, watch it again. Because when I was there, I said it. I said, I didn't know who won. I know it just felt very close. Could have been a draw. I thought Fury pulled it out by a point or two. There, I felt, but I wasn't sure. You could have, you could have moved me a little bit. I mean, but I knew that I had to watch it. And I got home, I watched it, and I saw, you know, I saw Fury winning, winning the rounds, winning enough rounds to, to clearly win the fight. But in a competitive fight, in a very interesting fight, and in a great. fight, performance by Nganyu and a win. A win by Nganyu for all intents and purposes. His stock went through the roof. Uh, nobody expected him to do that. And when I was breaking it down, I tried to break it down on all dimensions for you people. All dimensions. And when I was breaking it down, I said, I want to give credit to the trainer, Dewey, because, you know, he did an uh, incredible job preparing this in Ganyu uh, and making him look like a fighter. Uh, he did a great job. And Ganyu's a great athlete, all that stuff. But And there was one guy I missed out, uh, his MMA guy, Eric. If you would Eric give, me, give me his... Yeah, I, I, I want to put you in there too. <laughs> because I, I really, I, I, I just... I, I, what can I say? I was, 
I was wrong not to mention you. Not on purpose. Not on purpose, but just, you know, a miss. Uh, I was thinking about the boxing side of it, and I forgot about the striking side of it. Who, who's Eric's been with him, I think, from the, the whole time, from the beginning. And just, he deserves tremendous credit, just like I gave credit to Dewey. That team deserves tremendous credit. And during the breakdown of giving him that credit, um, and making sure now that I'm, I'm including Eric, which I did on my Pro Box show, by the way. I did include him. By then, I, I realized uh, that he needed to be included and that, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I just, I didn't realize what I, what I missed uh, on not saying him. Like I said, I was concentrating on the boxing side of it. I thought we got Eric in there. No, to be we didn't. Honest. But I, okay. I don't think we did. But now we did. If we didn't, we get him in again because he deserves it more than once. Yeah, Eric Nixick and Dewey Cooper. And the thing that I broke down, I wanted them to get the credit. And I said, look, on on the, on the face, when they put it out there, it was Mike Tyson was training them. But that was mostly for promotion to get some more pay-per-view, some, some, some more, uh, you know, obviously photo ops to build the fight up bigger, to, to build it up. And but the actual training was done by these guys. Do you know that there's some? I don't know. I I, I don't like to be mean spirited, so I'm not gonna be. Uh, Dodo birds isn't mean spirited, is it? Can a do, do, do <laughs> these do birds, days? Uh, that's not these that's days that might gentle. be a compliment. Yeah, that's gentle. So the, some dodo birds out there actually said, you know, Sam, there's dodo birds out there. They're not as extinct as you think they are, and. A few of them said, uh, from what I was told, oh, Teddy's hating on Tyson, not giving him credit. I'm not hating on him at all. First of all, he brought, I'm, I'm sure he brought confidence to Nganyu because Nganyu um, ad, admired and looked up to Tyson. So I'm sure that he brought confidence to him um, and a good energy to him. I, I'm sure of that, to be around you know, uh, a former heavyweight champ of the world. Uh, that was as destructive as he was. So, I, I, but I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie to make someone think that I'm not a hater. If you think that, shame on you. Maybe that some of the people that say such things, I find out that they're guilty of such things. That that they're guilty of it. So they think you must be guilty of it. Well, I'm not guilty of it. It's it had nothing to do with that. Tyson brought good energy to him. He helped promote the fight. Um, maybe there was a couple of things initially that he showed him in spots. I'm, okay, fine. But as far as the impactful day-to-day -day regular training that I know about is probably better than most people, that you're, you're in camp for a couple months and you're there every day. And Ken witnessed it when he was in camp with me, with Vosik, where you're there every day paying attention to every detail, in the ring with him, showing him, breaking film down, show, showing him the... the the, illustrating to him the the technique that that you want him to be able to execute the fight plan you're in there working sweating your backside off every day going over every detail to try to make it a habit where he'll be able to have a chance to actually show it on that given night that that that's i'm giving him credit for that the the people that were doing that that was that was Eric, and that was Dewey. And again, did Tyson have a play in there? A hand in there in the way that he did? Sure, sure. But what I just described, the day in and day out, responsibility of getting that guy ready for what he's going to execute and try to execute in that squared circle on that night, that was those two guys. And, and anything less... I'm not being fair to them, and I'm not being honest to my to my audience. So any dodo bird out there says uh, I wasn't giving no credit. I gave him the credit that I thought that he should get. That yeah, he probably helped set a positive atmosphere, and also did. I'm sure 
show him some things like the uppercut was, and Ganyu had asked me to teach him uh, that, that he was mesmerized by, that, was, you know, that, that he was just stricken with the power of it and wanted to learn how to throw it. I'm sure that those kind of things uh, were, were gone over with Tyson. But like I said, a trainer who, who is the guy He's there every day, 24-7, on call, on the job. I mean, again, who worked the corner? Did Tyson work the corner? No. There was a reason why he didn't work the corner, because he wasn't that guy. And again, it's not hating. It's not that. It's called accuracy. It's called telling the story, the whole story, giving the whole what what is supposed to be given the actual documented facts it's called doing your job and i try to do my freaking job we should also give um accolades um to markel mar and the manager because that guy i did already some... yeah and i know that oh, no, you I talked know, to him you and 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 listen he he had a vision he had a vision when he left the big agency, he left and he and he hooked into Nganyu. He had a vision and a belief in Nganyu. And he had a vision that if he won the UFC, which was the key, that was the key, get credibility, have something to stand on. You can't just stand on that he's a big guy and he's, you know, he's potentially this. Get the title. Get the UFC title. And once they got it, I have no doubt that he had a vision because they met with me. They asked me to train him one day in the gym. And then and you came along. When when I meet someone, you guys wind up meeting them uh, if it pertains to this show. And he, I, I saw it right then. Matter of fact, I remember, this is years ago, I, a few years ago, I remember saying to him, I know what your vision is. Your, your vision is to fight the heavyweight champ of the world, win the UFC title. I even thought it might be to fight an exhibition fight with Mike Tyson. I thought that might be a possibility, like Roy Jones and Tyson had done one of those. But I said, your vision will be that or fighting the heavyweight champ of the world. I can see that because then you're going to go to that other place. You're going to go to that crossover place that, you know, that, very few can go to. The McGregor went to with Mayweather, you know, that very few can go to. And it's it's a high altitude place. And it's a place that has high high altitude money. High altitude money. And you know, visibility, everything that comes with it, but money. And he did have that vision. I said I, I could see it. And sure enough, he won the title and you know, they did what they did. They made a decision, which there was a risk involved to leave the UFC, which is a powerful, powerful, powerful brand, which deserves credit for getting in Ganyu to the place that it got him. It deserves credit for that. And he, they took that risk. They left. Never, never doubting their belief and the manager's belief, his vision and the vision that he shared, obviously, with Nganyu, that this would be their destiny, that they would pull this fight off, this, this huge money grab, but at the same time, make it where they had a chance to really be competitive and even win. Yeah. And that's what makes it, that's what makes it better. Yeah. That's what makes it better. That wasn't a pure, it was a money grab. I said it right. It was a dangerous money grab. It was a money grab, but... They prepared the right way. They respected it the right way. And what happened? They they did it the right way. It, it became much more than most anyone ever thought. That Yeah, they got paid. Everyone knew that. But would it be competitive? Very few knew that. Very, If anyone, we knew it. We knew it. Yep. But very few knew it. And they they put off the, the daily double get paid, yeah. and actually have some people think you won. That, that's a hell yeah. of a bonanza. That's a hell of a job. Yeah, what I, well, the only thing I was going to point out is that he took so much heat in the early days when, when Francis was beefing with the UFC. Yeah, if you're going to do something, you're going to take heat. 
Yeah, tons of managers were coming after Francis, and credit to Francis for sticking by Markel. They did it together, and uh, congratulations to the whole team. We're very happy for them, and uh, man, curious to see what happens next. They're certainly in the driver's seat. When you're looking to do something special, the flames are higher. The, the, the flames are higher. The, they're hot. And if you can't take the heat, you know that old saying, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> the heat's there. The heat's there. Yeah. The heat was there for them, and they took the heat. They handled the heat. But they knew the heat was coming. They understood that. They understood that, you know, with with greatness comes flames. Yeah. With the with the because there's a risk. There's a risk of with the with the with the desire to be great, you know, comes having to go to places that not everyone's comfortable going. Not everyone's capable of going, but not everyone's comfortable going. Some people are more comfortable saying, I'll stay right here <laughs> and not take that risk. Even though I'm not making as much, maybe, whatever, I'm, I'll stay right here where I don't have that risk, where I don't have that responsibility, where I don't have to feel those 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 jitters, those those things that, you know, you feel you feel those things. How do you think I feel in camp when I'm there with a with a fighter that you know is fighting for the world title? I mean, you you feel that responsibility. You feel you feel those doubts that you have to push away that come and say, "What if we don't make it? What if uh, you know I don't have him ready to win? What if he don't win? What if you know you gotta." You got to push those things aside, but they're there. You wouldn't be normal. Wouldn't be a real world if they weren't there. Everyone feels them. It's what you do. It's what you do that matters. And um, you know, again, there's plenty of people out there that probably have a chance. I know for a fact that have a chance to go higher, and and they actually turn it down. Say, no, I'm comfortable here, and God bless them. You're comfortable there, all right. God bless them. But there are some that turn it down because. They don't want to feel that. They don't want those responsibilities, that uneasiness that that comes, that doubt that comes with, can I handle this step? I know it's going to give me more for my family and for, or, but can I handle it? I'm kind of comfortable here with this. I just say, go for it. I just say, you know what? Yeah. You, you, Go go find out. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Go find out. You know, yep. those I always say the great ones are explorers, Ken. Yeah. They're like the great explorers, you know, from from our history and all histories. Where, you know, they want to go find. They're not satisfied with knowing they know this is here, they know that's over there, they know that's over there, but they want to find what else is over there. What else is over there? And it's a risk. They might not come back. <laughs> they might not find it. They might waste all that time and all that effort. But it's worth the risk. Yep. Because they That's right. Because otherwise you're not gonna find out. What if? You're not gonna find out. Anyway, let's find out. Let's find out right now what happened over this past weekend. We had a lot of action and we got a lot of action coming up next week with with a with a very interesting uh card that has changed a little bit at Madison Square Garden, a UFC card, but a very, very interesting card. Um, let's start getting into it all. What do you say? Yep. Let's start out with a guy who was willing to take a risk, go over to Monte Carlo, Edward Vasquez, and take on the undefeated Joe Cordina. And he found out just how corrupt boxing can be. For my money, Vasquez beat the brakes off Cordina, yet still lost the decision by the scores of 114-114 on one card and 16-12 on the others. I think that conservatively you could have had Vasquez win in 17-11, you know, just from watching it as a casual observer, but no one cares what I think. Let's hear from the master. Teddy, did Vasquez get robbed and or did Cordina handle business? All right, I scored it, which I don't always do, but I did. I made sure I scored it because, you know, I knew that this would be the question. And the first thing I say, he did not beat the brakes off him. These, are, these fighters, both of them, are too good for either one to beat the brakes off the other. But I can say 
very, very, very um, sternly uh, that 116, 112 ventures on corrupt or maybe goes right to corrupt to, to, to your point. Maybe goes right to corrupt. Something's wrong. Like Customato would say, you know, it's, it's one of two things. Either they're incompetent or they're corrupt. But either thing is not good because somebody's life, somebody's career, sweat, blood, literal sweat and blood is on the line. The future of their family is on the line. So, no, he didn't beat the brakes off him. Um, no, it wasn't a Briggs robbery. No. But 116, 112, no. That's a no. The, the, the even score, I could see the even score. All one point for Cordina. But just again, we need a national commission, and I'm trying to do it. Keep signing that petition. We're, we're, we'll go to Congress. We're putting together all the pieces. I got Keith Sullivan. I got Pedro Martinez Vaga helping me. I, I got Dan Donovan, former congressman from Staten Island. I got a, a few other people that are getting it all together now. Keith Sullivan's a lawyer with my foundation. Great man. Boxing uh, manager, lawyer with Andy Lee. He also represents Tyson Fury in some ways. Uh, a guy that, he look, he's a salt of the earth guy. I wouldn't be around him this long if, he, if I didn't find him that way. And he is putting together, we all are, but he's, he's putting together all the paperwork, everything we need. My son just helped us. My daughter just helped us putting together a bunch of videos from the past, a bunch of newspaper articles from the past, stuff that we're going to show to Congress to show the pattern here, the pattern of something being wrong and that it's been shown for way too long, way too long. So we're not playing. So sign that petition because... We need we need help. And 116, 112, again, it's it's the bullhorn that yells for help. It is. And I broke it all down, and I hope everyone appreciates the way I broke it down. Um the first thing I say is that both of these guys are solid, really good. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the fight. They are solid, good fighters. Both of them. Um Cordina is undefeated. He had the title. Of course, he was defending it. Uh, maybe he got extra points for home cooking and being, you know, or being, uh, being the promoter's guy, you know, Eddie Hearn's guy, whatever. Something's wrong with 116, 112. Even one point, either way, fine. I, I had it one point for Cordina. And I'll give it all to you. I'll break it down for you how I got there. But... Again, ludicrous, 116, criminal, 116, 112. Um, and, and Vasquez was upset. You know, he, not that he was a bad sport, but he wasn't real friendly afterward. I don't blame him. He was upset. <laughs> he was upset. And Cordina got upset. Cordina was going to be gracious, but then he got upset, and he wasn't as gracious because Vasquez, I, I get both sides. I get it. They're fighters. They're competitive. Vasquez has the right to be upset with those two scores. Um, I think that part of it is Cordina is a prettier fighter. What do I mean by that, Teddy? I'll tell you what I mean. He's more picturesque. He's more boxing 101, the, the, the book. He, he's the conventional book. Stands straight up sometimes. Beautiful boxer, uh, mostly on the in, outside, you know, real he could be a sharpshooter, pinpoint punches. He, he sets him up with the jab. He can counter punch. He can go inside when he has to. Just just a, a real complete, pretty, the way that does it by the numbers, the way you want someone to do it to look like a fighter. And if, if, I, was using, if I was using art, and boxing is an art, it's a sweet science, if I was using art as a, you know, as a analogy, I would say Cordina is the Michael Rembrandt. Uh, uh, the strokes, the paint strokes are, are seamless. They're, they're straight. They're perfect. Vasquez, on the other hand, uh, can he, 
he would he would be more he would be more the um uh graffiti artist he yeah he'd be the graffiti artist i i love the, when they do it the right way but it's a matter of taste he's the graffiti artist it, it's rough it's not smooth it's rough it's it, it's it's not what you're maybe comfortable seeing like graffiti versus fine art yeah because the graffiti guy gets down and dirty now listen Cordina get dirty too down and dirty when he has to he'll get into those trenches <laughs> he's a hell of a fighter but Vasquez does it on a regular basis you know, he doesn't paint with those perfect strokes. You know, he his strokes aren't quite as perfect. and But he's still putting art up. It's a different form of art. But it's still the sweet science in its own form. So here's the breakdown. First round. And I'm giving it all to you. And I'm going to make sure I give it to you right. I'll put my damn specs on. <laughs> I know you're serious when you put on your reading glasses. Very. It's go time. <laughs> it's like putting in your mouthpiece. Yeah. Okay, you want to play? I'm putting in my mouthpiece. <laughs> Cordina, first round. In charge. Jab from the outside. He's longer, taller, controls the outside using jab. Throws a nice sharp left hook to the body. Okay, first round. Uh, that's him. Vasquez, game and aggressive. Only possible floor with Cordina, and this is from the first round. He stands a bit tall on the outside with his head up and sometimes goes straight back a couple of steps where if you go with him, you can catch him. Okay, second round. First round, Cordina. Second round, Vasquez is hanging in there. Obviously, he was a big underdog. Hanging in there with him on the inside. He needs to be on the inside. But Cordina has more options. He can go inside or outside. He's got those options. Cordina looks bigger and stronger. But at the end of the day, even with those options, Cordina likes to make his living on the outside for the most part. Okay, first round Cordina. Second round Vasquez. Third round. Edge to Cordina. Fourth round. Cordina outside. So the third round we gave to Cordina. Fourth round, Cordina outside, control. Inside, mixing it up very well. Inside work, then outside. Again, Cordina shows that he's very able to transist from inside to outside. He's very dimensional. Even though, again, the outside is where he would, for the most part, prefer. But... Vasquez needs, for the most part, to be on the inside. The edge for Cordina, because again, he can swim in both waters, inside and outside. He hurt Vasquez a little bit in that fourth round. And he also has figured out, Cordina that is, that the uppercut is there for him from the beginning for Cordina because Vasquez is shorter, He's usually looking to come forward. The uppercut can be a good weapon. Fifth round. Vasquez may have stolen it. Out hustling Cordina. Vasquez is very game. He was hurt in the fourth, but he came right back and took the momentum away from Cordina. The commentators seem a little bit in favor of Cordina. Just a bit. Because he stands tall and straight up with his chin high, Cordina is vulnerable to right hands over his jab at times. Sixth round. Also because of the right hand landed on Cordina, landed on Cordina, Vasquez took advantage of, as what I just pointed out, that he can land the right hand over the jab. He stands straight up at times. And I thought that Vasquez grabbed a close sixth round. Seventh round. Cordina wins. Controlling the outside with the jab. Vasquez, I made a note to myself, cannot win this fight on the outside. And then I made a note. Commentators were, were good. 
I want to make sure I say it because I damn sure say it when they're not. But they've been given pretty good, accurate commentary. Eighth round. Cordino was the boss on the outside again. Pot shotting with right hands, using a jab well. And when Cordina needs when he needs to, he goes inside too, as I've been, you know, documenting. But the outside, again, I said it earlier, is where Cordino makes his money. Eighth round, Cordina. Ninth round. Good close round. I give it to Vasquez. He outworked Cordina and he grabbed the round. Eleventh round. It's a good close fight. I made a note. Good close fight. Vasquez, very solid. Dependable guy. He gets to the geography that he needs on the inside. But Cordina wins on the outside and holds his own on the inside. Vasquez needs to be a little more dominant on the inside. Tenth round. Very close. But Cordina takes it. He takes it down the stretch. Again, very good fight. Two real pros, solid guys going into the 11th. 11th round. Vasquez's round. Vasquez, beautiful job of picking spots to outwork Cordino. Made a little adjustment. He's outworking him in close where he has to be. Then he gets out of range on the outside, so he's not controlled by the longer, taller Cordina. And Vasquez has found a home. For his left hook. Twelfth round. Tremendous end to a great fight. Back and forth. Final round. Every time Vasquez was caught. He never allowed Cordina to keep the momentum. Or build on it. He came right back with his own. I'm unsure of a winner in this last round. Although I lean a little bit towards Vasquez. But I want to. Being that I'm not. Absolutely sure, I make it an even round, which I try not to do, but at the same time, I try not to be afraid of doing if the rounds are that close. That's why there are even rounds. One, and then, here's my card. I'll show it to Sam. Don't worry about the scribbling where I've, I I just added a little wrong because, you know, I know that you, you right away... If I saw that with the judges' cards, <laughs> I'd say, oh, yeah, what happened? You corrected some stuff, <laughs> but uh, no, what happened was I never, uh, I put it this way, I wasn't in class all the time, okay? I wasn't always in class, so I had to go back and check my math, but I got it right. Final, I got it was 115-114 for Cordina, but... As I said, and you can see here, I made a little mark in that, in that last round that was an even round, the 12th round, 10-10. I made a little mark on the side of Vasquez. The reason I made that little mark is what I said a, a moment ago, that I was leaning towards him. Um, if I had given it to Vasquez, it's a draw. It's a draw. So one point, I have it. But 116, 112, and, and I went through all this effort because I thought, well, first of all, I think it's my job when it's a controversial situation or possible controversy. And I think that, you know, that's what the fans want. And I think I owe it to the fighters. I owe it to both fighters. But I owe it in this case to Vasquez too, that the underdog, that if I feel that way, uh, these fighters don't have a voice. They don't have a national commission. The other sports, they have voices. In this sport, they really don't. So whenever I can, I'm going to be that voice. Whenever I can for them. And try to, you know, try to at least put out there what I think is right. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I made my notes. 116, 112, inexcusable, awful scores. Um, I made a little note to myself. The, the cards might have been filled out before the fight started. Um, but 
I also made a note to myself that they might have just, and I, I touched on this earlier. Ken, they might have just liked a prettier guy. Maybe there wasn't corruption. Maybe it's a little incompetence, and maybe a lot of incompetence. But maybe they just liked a prettier guy, you know, where they, you know, they, they feel more comfortable with a guy doing things the way that Cordino was doing it versus, like I said, the more helter-skelter way that Vasquez gets things done. See, at the end of the day, you got to put that aside. All that matters is who's landing the cleaner, more effective punches, no matter how they're doing it. I don't care if yeah. they're picking their nose before they do it, <laughs> which is hard to do with a glove on, Ken. But I, I, I don't... Uh, <laughs> Sam's laughing. I don't care. But... All that matters is whoever does that better, I don't care what they look like. They get they should get the rounds. And they should get the fight if the rounds add up in their favor. So anyway, it was a good fight. It, it was. It was a good fight. As I've said too many times in the past, and some people love me for it, some people hate me for it. It's okay. It's all right. Like Ali said, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. I understand. Uh, keep coming. Keep coming, though, because I'm going to keep being what I am. And, um, you know, I, I've i said it too many times, and I'll say it again. The fighters were beautiful that night. The fighters got it right. The uh, administrators of the sport, nah. Not so, <laughs> not so much. Not so much. Not so much. Um, we got a few other fights to go over, but I think yep. that covers that fight as well as as well as I could cover it. Yeah, in the uh, in the main event there, um, South Africa's only reigning world champ, Seventy Non Shinga was knocked out in the second round, shockingly to lose his IBF uh, light flyweight title to Adrian Cur Curiel, again, at that show in Monte Carlo in front of two or 300 people. Um, man, what a shot this was. I know you watched this one, and I'm dying to hear what you thought of this punch, but man, he uh, he put him right out. Referee waved it off as soon as, um, as, soon as Curiel went down, as soon as um, Nonshinga went down. Yeah, I asked Rob to put it up, so... I don't know if we can actually do what we've done in the past where we're able to walk through it, where I could show how he and why that punch was so, obviously, just so, you know, effective. And Here it is. Ask and you shall receive. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Rob Moore, who, when he's not producing the fight with Teddy Atlas, produces the Andrew Huberman Labs podcast which is a massive show as well. We're, we're um, proud of everything Rob has done. Yep, and here, here it is. Um, see, the reason why I want to show it and break it down this way is because Curio is not known for his power. Uh, he was 24-4-1, I believe. So he had 29 fights, and he only had five knockouts. So, And he's only 24 years old. So not known as, you know, he's not known as a as a big banger. But he got a big, big, big sensational knockout. I want to show the people you don't have to necessarily always be a big banger to score a knockout. You have to land clean in the right spot and you got to land what I call a naked punch. A punch the guy don't see. So what does that mean? You have to have perfect execution, perfect technique. You might even have to have a trick. And he had a trick. And, and I got to say, you know, that um, I talk about this, quite frankly. I, I know that I'm taking a minute to, to do a shameless bit of a promotion for myself, but I don't do it too often. But on dynamic striking with my instructional videos, I teach this. I teach it in the gym, and I show how to do it in those instructional videos where... Curio just won the title in a huge upset with a perfectly executed delivery of a right hand, but it's the nuance. It's the nuance, and we're going to show the nuance in this. 
Now Curiel is in the is in the dark. Um, Curiel is in the, uh, the yeah. white. He's the white guy. He's the white guy. Well, the Mexican, Mexican. Who's also in the lighter trunks, and before we let it before we let it go, he's gonna he's gonna land a right hand. Timing is part of it, but watch where I talk about the subtleties, the nuance, the trick. Watch how beautifully he wants to land this punch blind if he can. In other words, where the opponent doesn't see it because then it's going to have the most impact. And then you don't have to, again, then you don't have to be a Joe Lewis, Mike Tyson type power puncher, you know, to do damage. And this is exactly the example of that where he hits him with the blind punch because of the perfect execution where he will move he knows that the eyes look look at the head right now of the opponent where he's looking to see what might be coming and where Curio is going to really throw him a, a fork ball, a curve ball is he's going to move his head, his upper body to the left a little bit as he delivers the right hand just enough to get the eyes of Non thing thinga, non thinga. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. To get his eyes to go with him, and if his eyes go with him, he's not ready to handle the punch that's coming. He's not ready to register in his mind, prepare for this punch because that's the big part of taking a punch. You got to have a good neck. That's the shock absorber. Thick neck, uh, like in Gan you had. What a chin he showed, and he even took elbows. But you also have to have a great will. To have that will, you have to have great concentration. And that means you have to see the punch so you can set your mind to say, no, I'm not going anywhere. The opponent here could not set his mind to do that because he never saw the punch. So let's run it through and, and we'll see the right hand that will come he gets himself in good position with the legs, and bang, he moves his head a little bit to the left as he throws the right hand, and he times it perfectly. The left hand is coming out, and that's something that I also talk about all the time. Let's freeze it for one minute. All right, freeze it. When you throw a jab, you should not leave it out there. First of all, you got to throw it from a distance where you're safe. You can see Nonfinga throws it from a little too close. He leaves it out there. He leaves that. But look at the head, the upper body of Curio. It's already moved to the other side. So he's looking there, and the right hand ain't coming from that side. It's coming from the right side, right over that opening that was left by Nonfinga by leaving his left hand out too long. All right, let's run it regular time again, and we'll see it. The jab is going to come from too close by Nonthinga, where he's allowing Curio to get close. The right hand lands. The left hand, the jab was left out there. I have a saying in the gym, Ken, you've heard me say it. When you throw a jab, throw it as though you're testing hot water. You know, you don't want to get burnt. You want to throw it out fast and get it back fast. He did not do that. No, think of this is just bad technique that gets picked up in the gym. It gets allowed in the gym. I'm not knocking the trainers, but you got to pay attention to what seems to be little details because they're not that little. Because when moments like this come, it's the difference of a win, a loss, and the difference of a career going forward or downward. It's not so little. Those are things that a trainer is responsible for. That if I see a guy in the gym throwing a jab and leaving it out there too long, what am I going to do, Ken? What am I going to do? You were there. <laughs> uh, pick, pick your poison. He's going to hear about it in any number of ways. And you know what? I'm going to jump in the ring. I'm going to jump in the exactly. ring and disrupt the sparring and say, hey, look, you didn't get hit, but you could have got hit. Because you left it out there too long. You can't leave it out there that long. Because one day, 
somebody's going to be ready to throw that punch and you're going to pay for it. So you got to correct it before it's too late. You got to correct it now. And this is a great the other teaching thing I'd moment. Say, yeah, the other thing I'd say, if you look at the power that um, Curiel throws here, if like when that, when that, when the, when the angle is paused when he's in mid-shot, uh, it literally looks like he's a pitcher. And when they say throwing a punch, yeah. I was, I've been working with the kids a lot. It's literally just like throwing a ball. And if you imagine that ball in your hand, he's getting everything into this. Yeah, of course. But here's and the just, key. He's pivoting on his right foot. He's putting his back into it. But yeah. the key here is he's. if you look at his head, the trajectory of... of Nonthinga's head, his eyes, you could see. We don't have a clear shot of it. I get it. But you could yeah. see that it's pointed over towards the right where yeah. he's following the head, the upper body movement of Curio. Look at Curio's head. It's over on the wrong side. It's, all, it's over. He's throwing a right hand, but his head's on the left side. That was just enough of a distraction to get Nonthinga to look there and then, of course, with the floor of leaving the left hand out too long, throwing it from too close, creating that opening, bang, and let it go. Let the whole thing play, and you'll see the... You see the results. Reminds me of a Chuck Liddell punch, how he would look down, just like you're describing, and throw that winging overhand right where if it hit, if it connects, it's lights out. If it misses, Again. You know, you're in a vulnerable position. But, man, what a shot. Beautiful execution. Not just power, not just throwing a punch, but knowing how he was going to throw it, knowing how he was going to execute it, knowing how he was going to set up his opponent. And he set up his opponent beautifully. Beautifully, I, I wanted to take that teaching moment because I want to show, and it has been for the last several years, a show that you can learn something, I hope. That you can walk away saying, you know what? I learned a little something. You know that, that, <laughs> you know, that, that teddy that I hate? Once in a while, that, <laughs> you know what? Once in a while, I actually learned something from that son of a... <laughs> God. <laughs> No one hates Great you. Great job, Anyone Bob. who hates you, anyone who hates you hates themselves. There's no reason for someone to have hatred. You could disagree, you could dislike, but hate is a bit aggressive. <laughs> Great, um, job. Great job, Rob. It was, uh, I hope that there's a lot of young fighters out there that benefit uh, from seeing that. Benefit on both sides. Uh, the, the, the side where it's landing, the side where it's getting caught, where... <clears throat> you see how you can set up a punch. Yeah, he got his feet in the right position. He got his distance right. He didn't have to reach in. And on the other side, to avoid that happening to you, that you shouldn't leave your left hand out there, your jab hand. You shouldn't throw from too close because you, you know, it's like leaving the window open in the middle of the winter. You're gonna get, <laughs> yeah, it's, you're gonna get stiff. And in this case, you get stiff. You get knocked That's stiff. That's it. Yup. Well, let's jump over to the heavyweights in action. Everyone loves a heavyweight fight. F.A. Ajagba runs his record to 19-1 and with a knockout over Joe Goodall in the fourth round. Uh, Nigerian stops Australian in the fourth round to avenge a fourth round of... Uh, of to avenge a split decision defeat back in 2014 at the Commonwealth Games. But uh, right from the jump, in my, in, from my impression, F.A. Ajagba had complete control of this. It seemed almost from the first round that the stoppage was inevitable. It looked like Goodell, Goodell, Goodall was outclassed and way in, in waters that he wasn't used to. I mean, F.A. Ajagba looked great. But I'm curious to know from you, did uh, Ajagba look that good, or was Goodell just not not good at all? Because, I, you know, when someone's having a great night, it, he can make the other guy look bad, but I'm always curious to get your opinion if, if you think the other guy was just totally outclassed or if Ajagba was stepping his game up so much that he had it, he had no choice but to look bad because Goodell was just in over his head. Look, you're going to get the unadulterated truth. I, I Again, don't mean I'm right. But I know I'm telling you what I believe to be the truth from my 50 years of experience. And I know I'm not influenced by being paid by ESPN, by being a comment where I feel I have to leave it out. Maybe, maybe they don't even say it. Maybe, maybe the commentators over there don't lie. But they leave it out. They leave it out that 
what I wouldn't have left out. Maybe that's why I'm not sitting there. But what I wouldn't have left out, one thing, and you touched on it, Ken. You know what that would be? What I wouldn't leave What's out? That? He he looked good. But his opponent had something to do with it, that that he had the right opponent. That's all. That's all. I, he had the right, you know, not the good dolls, nothing, but he had the right opponent to look as good as he looked. And, and he looked good. He looked good. A jobber. I broke it down. It's only what three rounds, right? It went three rounds, I believe. I believe he got stopped. Stopped him in. Stop. Stopped, stopped him in the fourth round. Yeah, fourth round. Okay, so here it is. First round. And again, I'll put the spectacles on, just to make sure uh, you hear it right. First round. A jabba controlled the outside with his jab, picked spots for his right hand. Second round. Good dog caught a jabba with a good jab and right hand. A jabba stands up too straight and tall. You didn't hear that that night. That's all right. They're working for ESPN. <laughs> that's the guy. They're, they're putting the best out there. That's that's. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. And I won't be working there. Um, I get that too. Um, he stands up a little too straight and tall. And look, I don't want to be the party pooper, but I want to just say everything that should be said. I'm not trying to rain on anyone's parade. I'm also... One of those guys that remembers that old saying, you know, uh, don't tell me it's raining out when you're pissing down my leg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on. Let's go forward. So, good dog caught a jobber with a good jab and right hand in the second round. A jobber sometimes stands up too straight at times where his head is right there where you can catch him. Um, the second round was a close round. I give it to a jabba. So that's two nothing a jabba. And then big, big third round. I mean that was the beginning of the end. Big third big big third round. Beginning of the end. Uh a jabba dominates the third round. Controlling range with the jab. Keeping distance. Setting up the uppercut. Uh hurting Goodell. Doing a good job with his jab. Like I said, setting up punches. What I liked about Ajaba was he did a really good job setting up punches off the jab. You know, I often say, set the table with the jab, go eat with the right hand. He did a great job setting up punches off the jab. And also, see, I'm giving him all the credit, also that he deserves, he earned. And also, mixing up the lead punches with some good counterpunching catching Goodall catching Goodall as he tried to come in and also a nice job of a jabba moving his feet back ahead of Goodall coming forward so he always kept enough separation so that Goodall couldn't get in before getting caught a jabba had the right opponent in front of him to look good yes but he still executed where he needed to. I guess he what he got rid of him in the fourth, uh, but or yeah. did, or they stopped in the fourth. I don't know, uh, but he did all the damage right there in the third round. And and I'll leave, I'll say this, um, I wouldn't mind seeing. He's nineteen and one. He's got one or twenty and one. He's got the one loss where he lost to Frank Martinez, the Cuban, the amateur from Cuba, who I believe is still undefeated, who's going to be a player. Uh, he was with me out in Saudi, him and his manager. So I want to give them a little mention. Frankie, uh, uh, who did he lose to? I, I, it was the Cuban fighter. Look it up. I think it was Frankie. Who Martinez. did? Um, uh, that Ajaba lost F to. The one. A, a yeah, Jog F yeah, Jogba. He, he lost to Frankie Sanchez. Sanchez, yeah. So Chen says is a player in every decision. Way. And I hope he gets a shot somewhere. He deserves one because, you know, he took a risk. He fought an undefeated Ajaba. Uh, on his network, on Ajaba's network, and he, you know, and he beat him. So I think he deserves something for that. Uh, but Ajaba has uh, has come back really nicely off that loss. He looked good. I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see him fight the undefeated amateur. You know the top amateur that uh, ESPN does not the butt sign. Top rank does not the butt sign the top amateurs. That's what they do. And then they, you know, unfortunately, you, 
you lose some of the audience because for two years you just put them in there with basically cat and fodder, and who wants to watch that, you know? And then after two years, you're going to look for a spot somewhere and you're going to finally find someone. Um, I would like to see Top Rank put their undefeated... Uh, What's his name? Uh, what the heck's his name? Jared Anderson, I think. I think that's his name. I, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I don't. I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Jared Anderson. Uh, you know, he was a really good amateur. Obviously, they signed him up. They're taking good care of him. He's undefeated. He hasn't been tested yet. I think it's time. I think it's time. Uh, what? How many fights he got, Ken? He's got close to twenty, right? Jared Anderson, 16-0 and with 15 KOs. Yeah. Supposed to fight uh, his last opponent. He won uh, TKO in the fifth yeah. against yeah. Rudenko on the yeah. August 26th. No yeah. no scheduled fights as of now. I'd like to see him fight a jobber. You know, I could be a matchmaker. I, I'm being a matchmaker for you, just so you know it, for the fans. I'm sure the fans would like it. They don't even have a jog, but in the top 10. I'd like to see that. That'd be, ESPN that wouldn't be, a, that'd be a, a more of a test than he's been having. Um, I, I, you know, I, I could think of a few other tests too. The guy who I really want to see in the heavyweight against anybody is Otto Wallen. He was like, he, he was a referee's discretionary stoppage away from beating Tyson Fury a couple years ago. He had Fury busted to pieces. Well, he's going to yeah. be heard from. Gossier. He's just got a nice win. Yeah, that's right. The, the former, the former cruiserweight champ. I think he's the most underrated guy in the division, personally. Well, I'll he, tell you he one thing. awesome against Tyson Fury. He's not a spectacular guy in one area of talent. He's not a guy that has spectacular speed, spectacular uh, power. He doesn't have the neon, neon accolades, like you would say. No, he don't solid. have those. No, Ken, he's a solid guy. That's his strength. His strength is that and Joey Camacho's trainer, who does a great job. Yeah. Um, he's technically solid. As well as he don't do anything great, he don't do anything bad. And that's something to be said. There's something to be said about that, where he, he crosses his T's, he dots his I's. You know, there's no, there's no mistakes. Uh, he's, a, he's a big guy. He's a solid technical guy. And, yeah, he's worked his way back into a, to a spot now in every way to where, you know, he's he's got to be recognized in the heavyweight division after just winning a, a, a fight against the former undisputed cruiserweight champion um, who's now campaigning at heavyweight. So, yeah, I'm, I echo that. Wallen deserves, you know, and then we get a lot of people listen to the show, uh, a lot of people that work in the industry listen to the show, uh, you know, so... I'll, I'll put it out there. I remember I put out there years ago. I was on ESPN. I thought HBO, they disappeared. But I thought they were doing a horrible job giving all the money to the heavyweights to fight nobody. Millions, five million a pop for nothing, for no fights. And and I thought Ross Greenberg, quite frankly, was doing a horrible job. And uh, again, uh, does anyone have to really get Sherlock Holmes to figure out why I don't have a job? Do you? I don't think so. Because huh, I, I'm, I'm going to say what I believe. And good and bad of it. Uh, there's good and bad. But I thought he did a horrible job. Horrible. But he was given all these heavyweights $5 million a pop to fight nobody. And, you know, at the end, HBO disappeared. Because you can't keep putting those kind of fights on. You can't keep doing that. Anyway, it finally caught up to him. They had a long run. They had a long run. I went on the air, and my director, God bless him, my producer at the time and director, uh, Rob Biner, God bless him, he's gone, a uh, good man, and Matty Sanduli. But at that time, Matty, uh, Matty hadn't taken, well, Matty was always there. He, Matty was the, uh, the coordinating producer. He oversaw the whole thing. They allowed me, I told Rob, and Matty is, you know, is, is a, is uh, just like I'm giving the accolades to Rob. Matty gets them too, but I I said, give me. I want to say something tonight, and uh, I went on. They get nervous. Oh God, what's Teddy gonna say? Oh my God! And I went on there and I said, hey, 
the guy that's fought the most on ESPN and given us nothing but electric fights has been a guy named Mickey Ward. He's given us nothing but electric fights. And he, he, he's, he's going down the stretch here of his career. Give him a freaking million dollar fight. Give him a, you're giving all these, take one million out of the five you're throwing away to these heavyweights and give him a million dollar fight with Arturo Gatti. It'll be one of the greatest fights you ever saw. Two guys, uh, uh, Gatti was already there making money, but of course I loved him too. And uh, two action fighters, you're guaranteed, you don't need Teddy Atlas to guarantee it. <laughs> you're guaranteed that the fans are going to love it a lot more than they l- like this, this heavyweight, you know, uh, regurgitated uh, yesterday's or the or three days before meal that you left over, uh, you know. I mean, th- this you can't lose. You can't lose. Give him a million dollar fight. Mickey Ward has earned it. There's other fighters out there, but at that time, Mickey Ward earned it. Give him the freaking fight. I'll be damned. Uh, about five <laughs> days later, I get a text from Mickey Ward. Thank you, Teddy. I got a million dollar fight. But um, and I, look, <laughs> I didn't do it obviously, but I did my part that I believed in to try to awaken somebody, embarrass somebody, awaken some, put an idea in somebody's thick skull that, hey, you know, you're doing yourself a favor if you listen to this. You, you know, you're not just doing Mickey a favor, you're doing yourself a favor because it'll be better programming. And if they would have kept doing that, who knows, they might still be around. But, um, they and and I feel that way. I feel that I feel responsibility to do that sometimes. I felt that yeah, I I, I was getting a paycheck, but I also had an opportunity <laughs> to do more than collect a paycheck. I had an opportunity to help the sport, to help some fighters, to right some wrongs, to direct some people that might need a little direction. If I could, if I could, I, I felt that I just felt that if I'm in this position with this platform. I should also take advantage of this platform to do more than collect a check, to do what I just said. And um, I feel the same way with this platform, that I, you know, what I can, I'm going to say a fighter got robbed. I'm going to say a fighter deserves uh, to get a fight. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. Because again, I, I feel that it's, uh, we have a responsibility to try to do what we think is right to help others. When we can, when we're in that position, you got to help yourself. You got to charity starts at home. I get it, <laughs> uh, but you got to help yourself. You got to take care of your family. But once you're doing that, if you can help others, damn it, damn it, it's not a bad idea, <laughs> and it feels pretty good. <laughs> anyway, I uh, agree. Well, let's let's. We still got a ton of stuff to cover, Teddy. We're gonna give a long one today, but let's jump over to the UFC. They had a fight night down in Brazil. Derek Lewis highlighting it. Um, but let's start with uh, Gabriel Bonfim against the uh, Danish Dynamite Nicholas Dalby, the perpetual underdog. I think he's been an underdog in his last four fights, and of course, he's won the last four. Uh, so Nicholas Dalby eventually will be a favorite against someone. Um, he won them all. All three of the four by decision. He got the stoppage on Bonfim in the second round uh, Saturday night. But man, this was a great fight. You, just looking at them from the jump, I would say like Bonfim looked to your point earlier in the in the show when you were describing one versus a pretty fighter. Uh, Bonfim just looked much more polished, let's say. But yeah, that's a good God, that's Del- that's a good way of describing. You're right. And Dolby weaponized pace just like what a wrestler would do i was talking to my youngest son cameron as you know he's doing jujitsu but he's been wrestling a lot lately and one of the things i noticed is in wrestling man they just go all the time it constant sparring and pressing and it took a few weeks but cameron's his fitness has gotten so much better that even in jujitsu the guys are like man cameron's fitness is on another level so you know trying to tell explain this to an eight-year-old this fight was an excellent example where I had him sit down and watch me, and I'm like, look at how this guy just won't stop. Every time Bonfim goes against the fence or steps away, he wants to get a space to breathe, but this guy, Dolby, won't let him breathe. Because he had a plan. Bonfim Part of his plan was yeah. to wear him out. Yeah, and, and even though Bonfim might have, like, 
skill to skill. Maybe he was a better striker and a better grappler. But when you put it all together in mixed martial arts and Dolby put the heat on him, he just wore There's him down always and eventually a way got the win. To even the playing field where someone else might have more skill. Yep. Second round stoppage for Dolby. How'd you like it? What'd you think of the performance? Huge upset, first of all, that set the stage even more. Dolby, 38 years old, Bonfim, um, 26, so 12-year difference. Uh, huge upset, huge upset. Uh, Bonf uh, Dolby beats the undefeated uh, Bonfim. Uh, wow. Uh, that's the first thing. Wow. So here it is. Again, I went through the extra work of going round by round. Uh, first round on the mat where Bonfim is at his best. But Dolby survives. And in the second round, it's all Bonfim first round. Uh, he got the geography he wanted. And in the second round, Bonfim, he just keeps coming. Coming, walking through counter shots, um, you know, from from Bonfim, who did some good striking there. Uh, and he he just, as we just talked about, he's just looking to wear him down physically and mentally. Don't leave out that part. He just would not be denied. It was like watching, for me, it was like watching Frazier Alley, Ken. Just going back and forth, taking turns, hurting each other. Um, also in the first round, at the beginning, I just want to make sure it was clear, of the round, uh, Dolby just walked in as Bonfim counted him, but he weathered the storm and the storms. And it was truly what I always talk about, Ken, where I speak of the Customato used to drill into my head, where I speak of so often will, will versus skill. And you just touched on it with your son. Will versus skill. And Will always wins unless one man's skill level is so far superior that the other man's will never gets tested. That's the only time Will doesn't win. Otherwise, Will beats skill if everything else is even. And he reminded me of Texera and Blahovich as far as his physicality and force of will and durability. And what a chin. Um, what a chin. Oh, my God. He took some shots. Yeah, so Dolby <laughs> reminds me of those two great men. And, you know, he finished Bond film with brutal knees. I mean, those knees were brutal. Uh, so tough. And, so and, tough. And, you know, that was it. It didn't go, it didn't go that long. But... Uh, it was like watching, it was like watching a kettle of water boil, and you're watching a full <laughs> kettle of water boil, right? You're watching the boils boiling, and then you you leave for a couple minutes. You come back, and half the water's gone, <laughs> and your house is on fire. <laughs> well, no, we we got to be more. What I tell you about leaving unattended yeah, yeah. pots on the stove, yeah. Teddy. But we come back. Elaine, no, Elaine, no, you the cook. house ain't on fire. But <laughs> this the, half of the water's gone. It, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Yep. It got evaporated. It it boiled away. It was evaporated. That's exactly the best way I could describe what Dolby did to Bonfim. He evaporated yep. him. He yep, he boiled him down. He boiled him down till he wasn't there no more. That's what he did. <laughs> that's exactly right. And no, there was no freaking fire. And there was no fire. And there was no fire. You could almost see Bonfim's like will to be in there slowly start to fade. Not he was almost. game the whole time, but you could see his confidence slowly fading. Or well, quickly, however you want to describe it. I guess in the grand scheme of things, it was pretty quick. But that was an interesting fight to watch. And I think when you think about it from the perspective of an eight-year-old kid, and I'm trying to explain it to him, it really highlighted for me all the things that were going on that you might not consciously be aware of. But as I was trying to explain it, I was like, 
Oh yeah, that's an interesting point. But um, and by the way, Cameron said to tell you when he they're out, they're out of school today. I said, hey, I'm getting ready to record, so if you guys could be quiet. He's like, please tell Teddy that I said hello. And I said, you oh, know, I will. He's a gentleman. He's not only a savage; he's a gentleman. Um, it was he's a I huge fan, saying. dude. He he talked. He mentions you like a few times a week. Every time we go to train, he says, "What's Teddy up to? How's Teddy doing? When are we gonna box again?" So anytime he wants. Anytime he wants, he always has an open invitation. Thank you, thank you. I can never get enough of a good person. Never. Bad people, yeah. that's another thing. Stay, <laughs> no, stay no away. No shortage there. Stay away. Um, well, let's jump to the main event in this one. Derek Lewis does what Derek Lewis does and comes out swinging for the fences. Unfortunately, <laughs> as typical with the UFC, never an easy touch. They put him in with a pure grappler, Jelton, Jelton Almeida, and uh, it went exactly as you would probably script it if you didn't know what happened. Derek had a couple moments here and there where he could land big shots. Derek would use completely unconventional uh, jiu-jitsu tactics to just muscle his way up at times, which is pretty impressive when you think about how he has been able to like get up when black belts are on top of him using just brute strength. Literally, it looks like a street fight. But uh, Jilton was too much, but he couldn't stop. He could not submit this guy. And uh, all credit to Derek Lewis, both guys really. But man, Derek Lewis, he's that guy. Just he just has the will to survive. You can't. I, I, it would. Be, it's very difficult to submit Derek Lewis. He could take a beating. And he tried his and he's got the will of a. He tried he his darnest to do what he did with Blades and land that yeah. uppercut as as Almeida Almeida was coming in for the for the shoot um, and leaning for the shoot. Omeda just got away just by a fraction of not getting caught that uppercut because if he got caught That's that right. uppercut, Lewis would have got what he wanted, which was a knockout. Yeah, but there's a reason Derek has the most knockouts in the in the uh, in the UFC. Just unbelievable. But take it away. Yeah, again, I broke it down for the fans there. Uh, first round, a nice kick by Almeida. Uh, then he got the takedown. He threw a nice kick, and then uh, post mostly blocked, but. It, got him close enough for the takedown you got to have a delivery system these guys have delivery systems for the takedowns too uh almeida obviously did not want to be striking with the bomber lewis uh but he got the takedown in the first round over the heavier lewis uh show strength to get him down dominated him on the mat keeping lewis on the mat controlling him but lewis did well surviving it second round Almeida got take down again early as Lewis reached in with a right hand. He fell in a bit and got close, and Almeida took advantage of that and took him down. Uh, again, uh, Almeida had position, control, another dominant round on the mat uh, for Almeida. And uh, Lewis survived, but uh, he started taking more damage and wearing down a little bit. Third round, Lewis just missed, as I just alluded to. Just missed catching Almeida with an uppercut. Oh, so close. Uh, as Almeida came in to his legs to score the takedown again. Lewis escaped for a minute, got position on top, and scored with some ground and pound before Almeida regained his position. Uh, Lewis kept trying, kept trying. Uh, Almeida's round big again. Uh, Lewis took a lot of punishment at the end of the third round. Fourth round, Almeida, uh, as much as he's dominating, he's also showing that he's one-dimensional. Uh, look, Lewis is one-dimensional uh, striking. We had two one-dimensional guys. Almeida one-dimensional on the mat, you know, on the f getting down on the floor, and Lewis one-dimensional striking and always looking for the big blow. Almeida won the battle of geography all night to get to where he wanted to be to use his one dimension, uh, which is obviously on the mat. Lewis spent the night surviving uh, the submissions attempts at, of Almeida all night long. Fifth round, first time in the career of Lewis that he went into the fifth round. He's, he's really a true gunslinger. He gets you early, or you get him usually. Almeida could have done more ground and pound while he had Lewis on the floor, I thought, but Lewis did a good job 
of uh, controlling his hands from striking him sometimes and surviving uh, and and going you know going to five rounds and I think that's uh, I think that's all you need for that one thing I wanted to throw in there was an undercard there was another fight that I just noticed and I didn't have a chance to tell you about it before we came on the air but real quick I wanted to mention it was a sensational knockout where Brenner uh, I don't know if you saw it Ken but where he knocked out Kuszewski um, Brenner's 16 I and 3 I didn't see that one yeah he's 16 and 3 he's 2 and 0 in the UFC and he knocked out Kuszewski and um, his name is Elvis Brenner but anyway, he scored a knockout in the first round uh, over there in Brazil. And the way he did it, he he stepped in. He almost reached in, to be honest. But he stepped in with a right hand that missed. But it was a setup. It was a setup. He stepped in with the, to get him close. And then he did something you don't see too often. He weaved. So he steps in with the right hand to get close, a throwaway punch. And then weaves to make the counter because the counter was coming from Kuzmetsky. So he weaves to make the counter miss and comes right out of the weave with a left hook that lands on the side of the head, knocking Kuzmetsky out. A uh, real bad place to get hit, right on the side. I don't know if you got it there, but if you got it there, take a peek at it. I just wanted to give a quick mention um, and give credit to Brenner, uh, who I... Who I is uh, two and zero in the UFC, and uh, sixteen and three overall. Uh, he he made a big uh, splash. He made a big uh, a big bang, if you will. Yeah, yeah awesome. Um, let's get into the UFC two ninety five preview coming up this Saturday at Madison Square Garden. They just changed the um, main event, not the opponents, but uh, they had for a while. They had. Um, Aspinall and um, Poplovich as the main, but they just switched that out, Rob, and I just noticed as we were coming on air. So now they've got the co-main is Sergei Pavlovich against Tom Aspinall. This thing is has fireworks written all over it. Before we get to the preview and I get your predictions, let me give a quick shout out to our partners over at MyBookie. Check them out at MyBookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S, to take advantage of a 50% credit on your first deposit up to $1,000. You deposit $2,000, they'll give you another $1,000 to play with. Again, gamble responsibly, but if you're going to bet on the fights, go to mybookie.ag and use the promo code ATLAS. All right, Teddy, in the main, in the co-main, we got Sergey Pavlovich against Tom Aspinall. I was looking at the stats here. Pavlovich in his, law, in his last eight fights, all ending in the first round. He's 7-1, first round knockouts, and in the one loss, he was knocked out in the first. And he's fighting Tom Aspinall, who's 9-1 in his last 10, eight first round knockouts for... Um, Aspinall, eight round eight in the first, and then he got knocked out himself by the great Curtis Blades, and he got uh, knocked out in the first round. And one, sorry, one of his Andrei Olovsky took him two rounds, and he got a submission. Um, but these guys don't go very long, which is why we have an over under of one and a half rounds at basically even money under minus one ten, over minus one twenty. And on the fight line, it's as close to e it's dead even on my bookie right now. Minus one fifteen, your choice. Who do you like and why? Well, you mentioned Blades, who's you know tremendous and dangerous, and um, and for Pavlovich. His last fight was actually a win against Curtis Blades, where he scored a TKO. Yep. So, first of all, uh, a very good fight, good match. Again, kudos to the matchmakers over there, you know, at Dana White's uh, place over at UFC. That's why the, the brand has grown so much. They just put something falls out, it don't matter. You know, main event falls out, uh, they step right in with other fights that, you know, miss a beat. <laughs> And all the fights are competitive for the most part, uh, where it's hard to make an argument either side who's going to win. Uh, Pavlovich, uh, first of all, he he's never seen the second round in the UFC. So obviously if Aspinall can 
can survive that first round, get him into deep waters, if you will. That's what I'd be telling him as a trainer. Uh, it could be very interesting. Never seen. He's very explosive. Uh, never seen the second round in the UFC. Uh, 15 knockouts in the first round. Uh, Six-fight win streak for Pavlovich. And unbeaten, unbeaten since 2018, which is, what, about five years. Uh, pure striker for the most part for me. Uh, long reach, power. Uh, I, it has to avoid getting taken down uh, the way I'm looking at it. Aspinall is the more well-rounded fighter. And you know I like that. I like guys that are dimensional. I mean, I, I like guys that have more options. Uh, but he's got to be cautious early because Pavlovich is that explosive and that confident, obviously, hasn't, uh, hasn't lost in five years. Uh, so got to be cautious early. He had a knee injury, Espinal, in 2022. I'm guessing, obviously, he's he's all healed up from that. He's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So, so he's got the edge. He's got the edge down on the mat. If he can get Pavlovich there, I would think that he wants, they both love to strike. But I would think that he would like to <laughs> mix in a little bit of that if he could do some, you know, if he could look to land some takedowns. I would think that would be part of the fight plan uh, for Aspinall. Uh, again, he's more well-rounded. I love guys that are dimensional. He's got that advantage on the ground. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the more dimensional guy. I know Pavlovich is a huge, huge talent. I know he's he's got a longer reach. Uh, I know there's a lot of danger, especially early fast, but now, especially on the outside, trying to get close. That can be like going through a bad neighborhood where you could get mugged. <laughs> and and Pavlovich is pretty good at mugging you as you try to get into his neighborhood. But I'm going to go with Aspinall because what I said right from the outset. I like guys that are just a little bit more well-rounded. I'm curious who you like, Ken. Who do you like in this one? I would be probably rooting for Aspinall, but I think Popovich wins it. Yeah, I mean, listen, is he the favorite? I, I know you said it's very close. Is he the slight favorite? I'm curious. I would think he is. They are de de dead even. Minus 115, your choice, either guy. Does does my bookie give you... Uh, Give you any under over in this, or or that's not an option. No over under over one and a half rounds plus one sixty five under one and a half rounds minus two thirty. <laughs> that's a huge line. Yeah, minus two thirty under a round and a half. Well, that's like what I told everyone to in the end. Ganyu Fury fight. You know, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But when I'm right, I, I'm going to tell you to. <laughs> I'm going to take responsibility when I'm wrong. But I'm also yeah. going to take. I'm going to take a little bit of a bow when I'm right. And that fight, we made money. If if you went to my bookie, we made money for you in the end. Ganyu Fury. I liked the over and and the under was was a huge huge play. And and where all the money was, you know, it was minus whatever. It was it, you were laying a lot to take the under, because everyone thought yep. that it was a no contest. Obviously, that Fury was going to blow out and gone you, which didn't happen. Um, obviously, the bookmakers are looking the same way here with with Pavlovich, both guys being dangerous strikers, but Pavlovich being uh, being the guy that he is, you know, with all these uh, first round knockouts. 15 knockouts in the first round. That's all you got to know. That's all you need to know why the line. You got to lay a lot of money if you like the under. That's all you need to know. You're going to lay a lot of money if you like the under. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see if I can get it right two weeks in a row. I'm going to go with the over. I'm going to take the money. I'm going to take the money they want to give me. And um, I'm going to say that Aspinall has had a good camp. He knows what he's got to do to survive. Uh, early, try to get Pavlovich into the deeper waters. I'm going with the over. Yeah, I like that one too. I do think that that's a good possibility. Both guys know that the other one can end the night very quickly. Tom has some wrestling skills and grappling skills, like you said. So I wouldn't be surprised if Tom, like, if it goes to the canvas, 
or goes to the mat, Tom Hat probably has a slight advantage. On the feet, let's say it's 50-50. If I'm training Aspinall, I'm like, Tom, we don't need 50-50 odds. <laughs> if we can be 70-30 on the floor, get him on the floor immediately. Why go 50-50? If, if you, you can just... do it without if you can yeah. do it without walking into something. That's the problem. Exactly. So that's the rationale there. But I love that. I love that pick. I like the rationale. Um, all right, let's talk main event. I want to yell a quick yell out. To Brennan Wood and Ian Mackey, my friends, who always oh the uh, legends, they have, well, they're always there for me with when I tweet. I haven't been tweeting the fights, uh, the actual fights recently, but and of course Rob Moore. But I just want to tell them that I I'm always appreciative of them, and uh, Brennan Wood also helps me out with uh, with some of these uh, MMA fighters where you know he gives me his thoughts on them, which I appreciate very much. So anyway. The 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 next one uh, we got we got a great card. All right, this is an interesting one. Alex Perea versus Yeri Pohaska. Uh, this is interesting. Pere Alex Perea is a minus one thirty five favorite, even though Yeri Pohaska he's coming off an injury, had to vacate the title because he because he suffered a, a, a huge injury. I think it was his shoulder. But looking down the record, I mean, he's got like 14 wins in a row. He's 29-3-1. He was the reigning champ. He lost the title due to, um, like I said, injury. One, two, three, four, five. It was he's a bad injury. Ken, Ken, it was yeah. a bad injury, the shoulder. 100, 100%, but he's got 14, 15 wins in a row, tons of stoppages, and he's an underdog against Perea coming up in uh, coming up in weight. Um, obviously, Perea is a former champion himself in multiple disciplines, but I would just thought I would have thought the line might have been uh, tighter, or even having uh, Prohaska as the favorite. But this is going to be a freaking good fight. A lot of people ready for this one. Um, so the line is minus one thirty five for Perea, plus one hundred five for Yuri Prohaska. Over under one and a half rounds, almost dead even. Under minus one ten, over minus one twenty. Um, oh, it's going to be a good one. What do you think? Pereira moving up, tremendous kickboxer, tremendous striker. You know, had that huge show that he can handle the stage, the big lights, the neon lights, the the blinding lights of the moment. You know, he he knocked out our our good buddy. Um, Alessandra and Alessandra is the great champion he is came back and and knocked him out in the rematch uh, Pereira tre tremendous puncher tremendous striker uh, doesn't have a lot of experience that Prohaska has Prohaska the naturally bigger guy I think that injury looms big you know like I said he tore up that shoulder really really bad uh, if he's back if he's back a hundred percent mentally and physically, a uh, Pereira's a beast. He's he, he's a dangerous guy. I don't care if he's moving up. You got punt power. You carry that power up, just like the great boxers do. You know, just like Crawford carried the power up in all those divisions. He still had the power, just like uh, Manny Pacquiao, the great Pacquiao, carried the power up. You know, Pereira will carry that power if he catches you. He's gonna hurt you. Um, but Prohaska's oscar has got the experience. He's a, he, he's a, he's an animal. I mean, I'm not saying Pereira's not, but he's he's an animal. He's a, he's he's a savage, as my son would always say when he was scouting those great athletes in the NFL, and um, you know, obviously in the most complimentary uh, way. But he, that this guy's a savage, and that's how I look at Prohaska. He's a savage. I'm going with Prohaska. I, 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 you know. You're going to get a little tiny something back. Uh, you don't have to lay the 135. But um, I'm going with Prohaska. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. You know, Pereira might be the next uh, the next superstar there. You know, if, if he could step up and do it, do it at this weight class. Um, you know, uh, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to, he got slowed down a little bit by Adesanya uh, and, and where Adesanya caught him. Uh, in between a hook, he leads with left hooks in front. I don't like fighters to lead with left hooks in front. He's got a great left hook. But if you lead with it in front, guess what? There's a right hand with your name on it somewhere down the road that's just waiting to beat that left hook. And um, the the name for me is a name called Prohaska. Prohaska. <laughs> I'm taking Prohaska 
and I'm taking the over. Love it. Well, that's going to be a good one. Before we say goodbye, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the special offer. 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. And the thing that made me think about it is the upcoming Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner that we'll all be in it. We'll all be attending um i'll be packing my travel packs for that one because i believe rob and i are going to stay there for a few days so we can record some content on sunday after the fights on the um on the 18th and um we'll break it down and we'll put together one or two fight plans there on sunday at the trinity boxing club per usual but please go to athleticgreens.com use the promo code alice for the 10 free travel packs athletic greens is the all-in-one green drink made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients so you're basically getting your vitamins the way they're meant to be uh obtained through whole food sources i know it sounds like a bunch of like blah 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 but it's the truth anytime you can get your vitamins minerals and nutrients directly from food Food, it's always better than getting it out of a lab in the form of a pill. So go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas. Take advantage of the offer. Support the show. Take care of yourself, most importantly. We love you. We want you to be healthy and uh, be subscribers to the show for a long time to come. Um, what else you got, Teddy? The only thing I would say to you guys, I appreciate you guys coming in as always. And making that trip to come into the foundation dinner where we raise money to help people that are less fortunate, people that fall through the cracks, you know, a myriad of things. So that people can get a quick example if they are thinking about possibly coming or donating. Uh, we help people that get from point A to point B. You know, if it's a mom with uh, six kids, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of uh, single parents where there's not fathers there, quite frankly, in a lot of tough areas. And if it's a single mom with four or five kids and she's doing everything she can, but one of the kids got sick, she had to miss work for a while, so she's losing the apartment because she fell behind. She's going to get put into a city shelter with all these kids. City shelters are not safe. I'm sorry. The Dr. Atlas Foundation says, no, that's not happening. We get her an apartment. And... um. And we're, we're not miracle workers. We're not paying for the apartment for two years. Where we just get it from point A to point B. She gets back to work. She takes care of it. But we don't let her fall through the cracks for that moment. We, if it's uh, you know, they need a wheelchair ramp. It's not paid for by, by the insurance, uh, which is ridiculous. But it's not. So we pay for it. If a family doesn't, if their insurance doesn't have. Uh, the proper treatment program in the area of coverage uh, where their insurance is. They have to fly out of state to get uh, to get the treatment for a sick child. We fly them out of state, put them up in a hotel, uh, see if they're eligible for that treatment. Uh, small surgery. Sometimes doctors don't accept insurance at all, especially with specialized surgery. Some of these doctors only take cash. You know, if you don't realize that, it's real. It, it's real. And every once in a while, we'll get someone who will come to us with a child that had a need for specialized surgery that uh, one I could think of a couple of years ago was actually in Denver. The doctor was from Denver. And um, he was one of two doctors in the country that specialized in this very, very specific uh, surgery. And they didn't have the money to pay for the surgery, obviously. And uh, the insurance, like I said, doesn't cover it. So we we had to, we had her. It turned out to be it was a little girl. We had to go out there with the family to Colorado and get the surgery by the doctor that does that surgery. So whatever it is, we do small things. So those are huge things. Um, we do, but we do small things. We do whatever it takes. We can't do everything. We're not God, but um, we're no better. We're no worse than any other place out there that's doing good work. <laughs> But we do our share. You know, we do social programs. We go into at-risk schools, which is Title I schools in New York. What, what's that mean? The way they identify those is families making less than 35000 a year. Abstract poverty. No fathers for the most part. I'm not afraid to say that. A lot of people say, no, no, I'm not afraid to say that. That's the elephant in the room. That's a problem in our society. Sometimes there's not, uh, there's not enough fathers. Uh, they, they're... They, they think being a father is going to create a kid. No, being a father is being there. 
being there, good or bad, being there. And and a lot of times we're dealing with the ones that aren't there, quite frankly. You got great grandmothers, great mothers, and they're making up for it the best they can, but sometimes a father is needed. So we go into these adverse schools where these kids are out of control sometimes, and we tell them real straight. I, I don't make it, you know, get, get right to the point. Shoot it straight, right to the point, and say, look, you do something for me, I'll do something for you. And then they pay attention because they know BS. They used to be in lied and BS. They got a lie detector in themselves, even at 10 years old, 11 years old. So I said, here's the deal. Over the next two months during the semester, if you improve your behavior, if you start taking ownership over who you are, over how you act, how you dress, how you walk down the hallway, how you talk to people, how you treat your teachers, how you treat your fellow classmates, if you start doing that, I'm not asking for A's and B's, that'll come, that'll come. But you got to start in the right place. If you start caring about who you are, because these kids don't care. If you start caring about who you are, I'm going to care. I'm going to come back. And if you get put on a list by your teacher over the next couple months that you improved in these areas, I'm going to drop off 200 tickets to a Knicks game, to a Nets game, to a Mets game, to a Yankees game. And if you're on the list, you're going to the game because we're going to supply the buses too. Guess what? Guess what? It gives them incentive to care about how they're acting, who they are. And that's the key. Get them to care about, not a lot of people say, oh, you can, you can, these kids don't care about the, you. Or they don't care about my family. They don't care about this family. They, how are you going to help? No, 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 they don't care about themselves. They don't care about, that's where you get it. You, you don't understand if you're not in it. They don't care about themselves because of what they've been through. So if you get them to care about themselves, have a reason to care about themselves and how they conduct their lives, how they get through a day, how they treat people, how they behave, if you get them to do that and they start liking themselves, guess what? Magic. Miracle. They're going to start caring about you. But it has to start with them. And so we run these programs. We do a lot of other stuff. We we have a food pantry that feeds people because people in this great country are still going to bed in certain areas, hungry kids. So we do that. And um, the other thing I wanted to say was, that's what you're coming there for, to help us with that. I appreciate the hell of you guys for doing that. I appreciate all people that do that. And as long as you're going to be there so we could do a fight plan, you're going to stay a couple of days you might as well come on the Saturday after. The, the dinner is on the 16th. So the Saturday right after it is do what we've done for 27 years. This is our 27th year. What we do for 27 years now. The, that Saturday morning after the dinner, we hand out 2,000 turkeys and all the trimmings. All the trimmings. That, so 2,000 families that normally would never have a turkey dinner can have the same dinner that you're having, that someone else is having, that they should have. And um, we hand out the turkeys. The so people come, they, they pick up the turkeys. It's quite a scene. And I always, I always recommend and I, I ask parents to bring their kids. Bring your kids. Let them pick up a turkey and hand it to somebody. Let them help. Let them feel part of that. Let them see. Let them see that you can make a difference. That, other, that it's not automatic that you're getting a turkey dinner. That, that you, you're fortunate. Somebody, some, somebody made it possible for you to get that turkey dinner, your, your father, your mother. But uh, they worked hard to get that turkey dinner for you. But there's kids out there that don't have that. They don't have that father and mother able to do that. So let the kids see that and let them feel like they're making a difference. I, I think it's a great, great... We, I talk about learning tools about what I just did today, where, you know, teaching about boxing, and about certain things that I hopefully helps a little bit, but there's no greater learning tool than the learning tool of life, you know, to help and teach somebody to, to care about somebody else, to be appreciative of what you have, to understand that not everyone has it. I know you're doing that with your kids. I know Rob, if he's blessed enough to want to have kids, he'll be doing that with his kids. I know Sam does that with his daughter, you know, um, and I try to do that with mine. We and and I think that's you know that that's how you get a better world. That's how you get a better world, brick by brick, kid by kid. Anyway, 
that's my story. I'm sticking to it, and that's it. The only other thing I want to point out is I think I said that um, Aspinall got knocked out against Curtis Blades and many tore his MCL. Apologies. I want to make sure I get that right before I get massacred in the um, in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Mistake. No, that's, it, was list, it was listed on one of the sites as a KO, but I think it was a technical, a technical knockout because he couldn't continue, but it was a torn um, MCL. Yeah, yeah and, and they have that mutual opponent, that common opponent, and he got hurt, Aspinall, in that fight. You're right. And Pavlovich uh, uh, has a win, you know, has a win over Blades. So they do have that, that common opponent where Pavlovich has a win over Blades and, um, and Aspinall, as you said, right, he's, uh, he's got that loss to Blades uh, in, a, in a way that it was with, with an injury being, being a part of that loss. Yep. Well, great show, Teddy. Thanks for all the uh, insight. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. You know the routine. I don't want to sound like one of the YouTubers that my kids watch, but please like and subscribe. Smash the subscribe button. Do whatever it is you got to do to help support the show and let us keep uh, bringing you uh, high quality content. At least I hope you think it's high quality. We enjoy it. And I know Teddy spends hours getting ready. So Thanks for everyone for being with us. And Teddy, excited to um, see you in 10 days at the uh, Dr. Atlas dinner. It's always a highlight of the year for the boxing community in New York. And uh, I'm sure the turnout will be killer again. I always appreciate the people that come, the, the fans, the regular people that buy tickets, buy tables, that, that come and the companies that sponsor us and, and all the great celebrities. The, just unbelievable. I, I still am humbled by it. These celebrities, Lavi Holmes is coming, just just so many of them. Tony Dancer, I mean, Phil Sims, I mean, one, one Max Kellerman, Stephen A. Smith, um, I believe is going to be there. He's there just about every year. Uh, Sal Palantonio from ESPN. Uh, just I, I don't I don't have to list in front of me. There's there, there's just so many and and people that fly in like you guys flying in. Charlie Monahan flying in from Arizona and and his people and you know just I I just appreciate the hell out of everybody out of everybody because we can't do it. It's a collective effort. We can't do this without people helping us. Give us the resources to do it. So, yep. I'm always obliged to everybody. I'm always appreciative uh, to everybody for for their kindness and uh, their heart. Yeah, we'll talk more about it next week about the lineup and the rundown and what's going to happen at the dinner. And again. Uh, Listen, on Twitter, if you want to tag us and come up with some suggestions, Rob and I may have one or two seats available at our table, champion's table right in the front. we got to come up with an idea how to get a couple fans to the uh, dinner on us. So uh, if anyone has any ideas, hit us on Twitter. Otherwise, we'll be back next week with a last-minute um, contest of sorts to see who wants to attend the dinner as a guest of uh, me and the great Rob Moore, producer to the stars. Anyway, everyone, have a great week. We'll see you guys next week. Enjoy the fights next weekend.